Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Four Checking TV. I'm your host, Doug Gladke, and alongside me is my co-host, Scotty Porterfield. Scotty, how are we doing, buddy? We're doing the best we can right now, given the circumstances of our uh, of our favorite franchise. Um, not even just them, I guess. It's just Pittsburgh sports in general. This is kind of a down year for uh, for any Yenzer. You know, obviously we expect the Pirates to be in down the crapper, which they usually are in the... The Stellars are having some growing pains, obviously. it's uh, they, They're not doing too hot either. And now the one team that I always have hope in, our Pittsburgh Penguins are sitting next to last in the Metro. And we're only one month into the season. So we've definitely had better times, but uh, there is still optimism in the future right now. I'm an optimist at heart, I guess. So hopefully we'll turn things around. But obviously that's going to be the, the focus of our discussion today is uh, – what are, what can we do? With, what can the Pittsburgh Penguins do to sort of right the ship before things kind of go south? Because right now, I don't see any other direction but south for them. There's there's really nothing they can do. Um, I just want our audience to know it is November fifth as of this recording, and I've already essentially turned into the Joker. Um, so yeah. But, you know, this is this is what happens, man. I mean, Ron Hextall did a masterful job to bring back the core and extend Brian Rust and extend Ricard Raquel. You know, and I guess what I'm going to essentially say is before I get into this entire spiel is if they're going to suck, I'd much rather them suck with their star players and their top six playing their best hockey and still playing at an effective rate than it would be if the in, entire wheels fell off the wagon. Yeah. I mean, you know, I said, you know, obviously when they made all these signs in the off season, they basically said, we are going to live and die with the core that we've had for the last going on two decades now. And they're starting to lean more towards the dying side than the living side, unfortunately. And Unfortunately, this is the reality that I knew could potentially be possible. I think the comparison that I've always that this that I've always made with this team at the stage that they're at right now is how the Red Wings were whenever they were starting to wrap up their uh, their run in the early to mid two thousands. I mean, we remember how the Red Wings had their Nick Lidstroms and Henrik Zetterbergs and Pavel Datsuks. Those guys were all getting older. You know, the core wasn't didn't have the pizzazz that it once did. And, you know, this was a, and I understood that, Hey, this could definitely be a possibility with this Penguins team. And now we're starting to see a lot of eerie similarities between those two. I mean, you look at those, those Red Wings teams from 10 years ago, or however long it may have been, you know, some of the guys that they were bringing into the, to the fold, like remember the one year they had Mike Madonna and they had Daniel Alfredson the one year and, uh, they brought in a bunch of older players who were great at one point and were now just trying to hold on for another year in the league. I'm not saying that the Penguins are entirely like that, but you can kind of see some similarities with the team. I mean, you could make the case that Jeff Carter's kind of the same way. Jeff Carter's not getting any younger. He's definitely on the wrong side of 30, and he's starting to regress a little bit. He's been banged up for the past few games. He's not going to play tonight against Seattle. So there's that another comparison I can make, you know, bring in uh, a Jeff Petrie, a move that we in, that we thought, hey, maybe this will work out for us. So far, hasn't uh, bear, bear any fruits of, of goodwill yet, I guess. I don't know what the term that I'm trying to go for was there. But either way, um, Jeff Pete, yeah, Petrie isn't exactly the feeling that we thought it would be. They remember them saying, OK, we're going to bring in Jeff Petrie should we ever lose a Chris Latang. Well, Chris Latane sat out a game or two, and Petrie didn't look good. He didn't seem like he could step up and fill in that role. And I understand, you know, filling in the shoes of Chris Latane is a difficult thing to do, but I mean, he wasn't even close. And that's yeah. kind of the the downside of it is you're looking at it, you're like, okay, well, what what can this team do to sort of, you know, get things right? And the reality is that a lot of the moves that they, a lot of things that they need to change could have been prevented years earlier. I mean, you were, we've talked about it how many times through text, just about how this team is could be solid right now, but unfortunately the Braun players were prioritized and 
now the players that could be helping this team be a solid contender are lining up on other squads now. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the biggest thing that I think I want to get into is, you know, everybody will say, Oh, hindsight's 2020, but in this case, it really isn't because the players that we are talking about departed at times when we knew when, when they were showing potential of breakout, like, I mean, we were talking about this before. Jared McCann looked like he was about to become a 30-goal scorer. They gave up on him. I thought John Marino had a solid playoff. I thought him and Marcus Pedersen had a great chemistry in the Rangers series. And here he is ripping stretch passes to Jesper Bratt, making himself look amazing while putting up top five metrics and game scores across the entire nhl not even among defensemen but across both forwards and defensemen in the nhl you know you have evan rodriguez playing top line left wing with with uh nathan mckinnon and our and uh miko rantanen you know and that's that's the biggest thing is what does what what is the front office's um protocol for evaluating bottom six talent because there's no denying they can evaluate top six talent this might be probably the most solid top six they've had of the entire crosby malkin era but everything else around it is in shambles you know i mean we have the bottom six forward group filled with a bunch of over the hill guys or straight up paycheck thieves in players like Kasperi Kapanen. It's ridiculous. You know, I mean, the only good thing about this is, and this is so stupid for me to even say, it's only fitting that the Penguins completely go to hell in a handbasket in a year where a generational talent is projected to go first overall in the draft. It's a funny way of working out for them that way. They basically <laughs> love They've they've honestly lucked into two generational talents and two other ones that are pretty substantial in, in their own in their own right as well. But yeah, just going back to what you said about um I think like I said before, the wrong guys have been prioritized with this group. And uh, listen, I won't deny I wasn't on the Jared McCann bandwagon whenever he was let go. Cause I made the argument of, okay, I don't care if you score and I don't care if you're lighting it up in the regular season, I need you to score in the postseason. And he wasn't doing that. Well, then he has a third, then he had a 30 goal campaign and you're like, okay, that would have been nice to have here, you know, but at the same time, I was like, all right, again, same, same thing. Would it have worked in the playoffs? Probably would have. You know, obviously we won't know what that's obviously we won't we won't know now unless Seattle makes it in. Let me check and see. I don't know where they're at in the uh, in the standings at the moment. They are currently third in the Pacific. So that's uh, pretty close to to a playoff, I'd say maybe a wild card team. So. All right. Either way, uh, Evan Rodriguez was another one that was kind of up in the air. It's like, OK, we've seen him score in spurts. He was lighting the lamp constantly. We went to the game earlier this year in San Jose whenever he and him and Rusty had a uh, had the hat tricks together and I thought, okay, that was pretty solid. And then after that game, he basically just fell off the face of the earth for like 20 for 20 plus. And you're like, okay, what's going on here? So again, it was another case where it's like, you know, I want to have faith in the guy, but he scores in spotty situations. So it was tough assessing that as well. And then, like you said, with John Marino, was a great pairing with Marcus Pedersen, but there was always, but there was always some skepticism because we saw how great he played in his rookie year. He was again, offense doing well offensively and he kind of regressed over the last season or two. So then you begin to wonder like, all right, is this guy actually who we think he's going to be and who we, who we expected. And it gets, he gets a change of scenery in New Jersey. And now, like you said, he's lighting the world on fire. So good for him. And another guy that I think we always tend to forget just because his time here was very brief. Freddie Goudreau is a top six center in Minnesota right now. I'm not saying he was going to be that in Pittsburgh. and I didn't want him to, but it'd be nice to have some third or fourth line scoring, you know, 
there's no rule that says you can't have that. In fact, it's probably encouraged. You probably need it in order to succeed, I'd say. So, and the biggest, I, I will say this, the biggest surprise from the bottom six so far has been Josh Archibald. Maybe yeah. we were, we were writing him off before he even had a shot at making the team. And if we're being honest, he hasn't been a bad addition so far. No. I understand we're still early in the year and whatnot, but he has been a solid option. And he he's displayed some offensive instincts that I think could be useful. God forbid we actually do make the playoffs this year. We still have a ways to go, obviously, and we have a lot of things. The team has a lot of things to figure out. But based on what I've seen so far, he seems to have basic offensive instincts. And if he puts up 10 or 15 this year, you'll take that from your fourth line right wing. So yeah. no, so no complaints there. So we're obviously talking in circles at this moment. What we need to do is put on our, our Ron Hextall hats and figure out, okay, what can we do to make this, what can be done to make this group better? And to me, I think they are missing a very big opportunity with Sam Poole. I said before, you know, when Jeff Carter went down with this injury, what a week ago it was now, he's missed the last two or three games. This is the perfect opportunity to put Sam Poole in on the, as the third line center and let him run and let him run there and see what he could do. We've buried this guy in the minors for how many years now? He finally gets called up to the big club and he's sitting in the press box. Like this is your opportunity to show, to show what this guy can do. Give him a shot to prove it no disrespect to drew o'connor but drew o'connor is a fourth line player yes and i think he's a winner at that you know you know he's not a guy i want i want in at center taking face-offs i'm not a fan of it i'd much rather roll the dice with sam Poulin, who i think could be a solid two-way center and that's perfect for your third line let him run with danton Heinen and kasperi kapnan put him on the second power play unit give him a chance to show what he can do showcase his, his role of decks of talent, because I feel like they're not utilizing him as much as they should be. Just my yeah. Take. yeah. And I think, you know, real quick, just to touch on Archibald, there's so much potential there because he's scoring goals and looking decent with a four fine center. That is hot garbage. That is not Teddy Bluger. You know, because yeah. like we'll just 100%, say, it. yeah, Ryan Paling's not been great. You know, just, and he's been a stopgap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's an okay thirteenth guy. Like I'm okay with it. You know, and yeah, Drew O'Connor. I think you know, if they ever found a way to move out Brock McGinn, he's your fourth line left winger, in my opinion. You know, and with Sam Poulin, you need to play him, but you need to put him into in a position to succeed. You know, he needs to play with Danton Heinen. I think even when Carter comes back, I would like to see a few games of Heinen, Poulin, and Carter. 100%. 100%. You know, and I think the biggest thing that they can do, not even just from a GM perspective, but from a coaching perspective, is take Brian Dumoulin the hell off the top pair. You know, and I'll be honest with you, Chris Letang gets a free pass from me for all of his struggles to start the year because he's playing with a literal black hole beside him, you know, and no matter who Brian Dumoulin is playing with, he will end up bringing them down and making them worse. That is where we're at at this point. The wheels have fallen off the wagon from Brian Dumoulin. It's not, it's not in the Jack Johnson stage of peril, but it reminds me a lot of Rob Scuderi. Uh, during his second tenure in Pittsburgh, mm. you know, just very lost the first step, not, f not up to par speed wise. And he's just getting cratered every chance he gets. And plus let's keep in mind, P.O. Joseph has looked really, really good to start the year. And I think I that we have to start experimenting him with Latang. Uh, sorry to cut you off there. I was going to say, Outside of Jan Ruda, he's been the best defenseman the Pens have had well, so yeah. far. Yeah. You know, it's a three-man race between him, Jan Ruda, and Marcus Pedersen, in my opinion. You yeah. know, Pedersen's yeah. been very, very good so far. 
especially given the fact that he's been playing with Petrie, who has been god awful for a majority of the games, except for the Arizona one. Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree with that. So another thing that I kind of want to touch on as well, um, as we mentioned, you talked, you said earlier about Kapanen. I mean, at this point, I don't even, I don't even know what to think of the guy anymore. It, I mean, it's just for someone that had so much hype when he came back to Pittsburgh, it's like, okay, he's finally going to get his opportunity to roll that, you know, they're going to give him a shot here. He had a great comeback in that, uh, in the 2021 season it seemed like, all right, he's going to be set to do the right things here in Pittsburgh. Man, he's, I, I said, it, I said it last year and I'll say it again. He's still a lost dog. It really seems like he is like, I don't know what else to think of the guy at this point. I mean, he was getting fourth line minutes in the postseason last year. I don't, I think that's really the only place he can play now because he's holding back that third line. Yeah. And when you have, yeah. And you already have Jeff Carter on there. Who's going to be a step behind everyone anyway. Right. So that doesn't make it any better. And then you have Heinen who I think could be a decent third line goal scorer. Can't do that now because he has Kapanen on there. It's just like, it, it's really a tough situation. That's why I agree with you when you said, you know, shifting Carter over to right wing, that's a, that's a great idea in, in terms of putting him and pulling together. Because again, even if, you know, if there's a, if it's late in the game and you need a big face-off when your defensive zone, if you really want to roll that, if you really, you know, are shaky on how pulling would do, you can always tell, tell big Jeff, Hey, take this face off for us. Yeah. My big thing is, is like, how the hell do you think Danton Heinen feels right now, knowing that he left money on the table to stay here? He probably didn't expect the team to be this plus at first, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, but my thing with Kapanen is I don't think it's that he's just a bad player. I just don't think he works with what the Penguins do. You know, I just don't think he fits here because like these are his stats from every year since he's become a full-time NHLer, 44 points in Toronto, 44 point. Okay. So 44 points, 36 points, 30 points in 40 games in the pandemic year for the Penguins. And then 32 points in 79 games last year. That is a solid top nine, third line contributor. You can definitely, especially with what his cap it is, you can definitely get something back in a trade for him. But who would who would touch him at this point, though? I I mean I feel like I feel like that's one of those like change of scenery hockey trades, you know, like that's tough to forecast right now. But I'll put it this way: I don't think that Kasperi Kapanen sees the end of this trade deadline on the roster. Hmm. I'm not sure. I just I I. I want to believe that they could make something happen for him, but it's just like, I, I don't know. It's really tough to, it's really going to be a really tough call. Hopefully you're right. And they can make something happen, but it just seems like, you know, the guy just doesn't seem to know what to have anything going for him at this point. I don't know what the, what they could potentially pull off with them. I'm hopeful that they could do something. Cause it just, I have a hard time seeing, yeah, you're right. He just, he just doesn't fit in right now. That's all it boils no. down to. He doesn't yeah. seem to fit in. Yeah. You know, and like, if you are going to trade, trade him, you got to trade him for like a bottom six gadget player who can play, play both center and wing and kill penalties. You essentially have to go find your next Evan Rodriguez because they don't have that right now. I don't think they you can know. find him that easily either though. That's the, that's the thing. I don't think they, they can find him either. I know Colin Blackwell has not really fit in in Chicago, but you got to. Nobody fits know, in Chicago. It takes two to dance at this point. You know, you got to figure that out. Um, much. Yeah. You know, the biggest thing, though, is like, I feel like we haven't talked about enough, like how horrifically bad Brian Dumoulin has been. Like, it is just, it's on, like, I can't wrap my head around it. You know, and everyone with a brain could tell you that this was coming. Like it, he, he was, he was bad the entire second half of the year last year too. 
Yeah, it's definitely been a steep decline for Dumo, which is, like you said, it's unfortunate because obviously you saw how he, uh, you know, you remember how well he performed. He was one of the Penn's better defensemen back in the day. And now it's just like, that seemed like so long ago. It doesn't even seem remotely possible that he could have slept as badly as he has. But yeah, it's now gotten to the point where, again, you you can't give him that many valuable minutes. You know, putting him on the first pairing is an accident waiting to happen. You know, it's you have Chris Letang, who's an offensive-minded player to begin with. If you have to be back and defend, and if your guy, your guy, you're counting on to defend for you when you are trying to, you know, pinch up in the zone. If you're counting on him to help you out, I don't think it's going to be working out right right now. It's just it isn't. Yeah. He can't yeah. seem to get his stuff together, and that's why everyone's clamoring for the the P.O. Joseph. Uh, slot on the uh, on the first defensive parent because I think that could work easily yeah like you can't that's the thing like if Latin gets caught you you see it like the turnover happens and then the camera pans to Brian Duma and offend essentially flailing around aimlessly like a lost child in the produce section at Walmart like it's it's ridiculous You know, um, but here's the thing, like, like I said before, if they do miss the playoffs and they do actually end up being as bad as we think they're going to be, a few good things are going to come out of this. Like Fenway will have no choice but to fire Ron Hextel. Fenway will also get rid of Brian Burke. Not only that, but Fenway will 100% hire an analytically savvy GM that will not touch the core in any way, shape, or form and rework the bottom six. You win the draft lottery potentially, but even if not, guys going from two to 16 to 18 this year are all going to be very, very good talents that can likely play in the NHL next season. Yeah, I mean, you know. you know, obviously I don't look too deeply into draft rankings because the team that I root for is obviously making the playoffs every year, so I don't really concern myself with it. But, again, you know, it's – obviously, it's what, you know, they can say that. Obviously, it's way too early to tell if a guy is going to be, you know, in the NHL or if they could even be serviceable for an, a certain extended amount of years. But just looking at this team, I mean – it could potentially get to that point. It's kind of crazy to think about it, that the team could miss, but I do want to try and say this to, you know, calm the nerves of everyone that is going through this, like all of us are, I guess. Uh, It is only November 5th. Championships aren't won in the first month or two of the season. You know, they're won in April, May, June, when you should be playing your best hockey. The Penguins have been on losing streaks like this before. And they have happened in February and March where you, where you think the sky is falling same way you think same way. Most people think it is now. I'd rather them play their bad hockey now and get it out of the way than play it in April and in March and April, because that's happened in the past where they have played put like putrid in the spring. And that's when they get bounced in the first round. So again, like I said before, growing pains are, are to be dealt with but don't quit on the Pittsburgh Penguins just yet. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, and the biggest thing is, is like, you know, maybe the struggle, maybe there is some good in the struggle. Maybe the struggle causes them to, you know, take Brian Dumoulin off that parent, which would help them infinitely right away, you know, because if you put him in a sheltered third pairing role, there's really not a whole hell of a lot he can do to screw things up. And on top of that, Jan Ruda, in my opinion, is mobile enough to cover for Dumoulin's deficiencies. And he's a stay-at-home defense. So, like, basically all they have to do is just rip the puck up the ice to people. That's it. You can get away with that. That's again yeah. why I think Rude has been their most effective defenseman so far. He's been a great addition to the team. 
Um, again, he, he keeps it simple, and sometimes that's all you that's all you expect from your from your bottom six, from your third pairing mm-hmm. defenseman. So, if you get that from him and Dumoulin, I think they work a lot better together. And then, you know, like I said before, you put POJ into that role with Latang, you let those guys do what they need to do. That could be, you know, that's an effective first pairing, and that's and that's you know the expectation is that they can be effective. So, again, yeah. I think that should be. They should be very open to that. Yeah, you know, and they need they need more in the goaltending department too. That's for sure. You know, there there have been moments in these stretch of games since the Western Canada road trip started where both Jari and Casey DeSmith could have gotten them some big saves when they needed it and stole these games, but they did. Especially you know, especially in the bottom, especially in the Boston game, especially yeah. in the Boston game. Jari, Jari was not his best and the no. smith was the smith looked lost a couple times in buffalo i mean i don't yeah. know what the deal is but there's I'm, I'm watching it and i'm i'm watching the game and i'm just like what is going on with this guy like yeah. the, the pucks like the pucks clear over on the in the right wing corner or on the right wing side and the smith's facing the wrong way like the, yeah. the guy's got a wide open it's like he has no i don't know if he just has a if he can't if, if he can't track it i don't know what the deal is yeah. maybe he's Maybe they all, maybe, you know, with the new jerseys, they're just, he's mesmerized by them. I don't know what the deal is. I can't explain at this point. It's just like, he's, he looked lost. You know, I'm, I'm watching the game. I'm like, you are, he's late. He like the puck's already away from where he's looking. It's like, turn, get over, you know, he's, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's painful to watch right now. That was, that was great. Great play by Owen Power. Great players making great plays between him and Olsen. But like, dude, like there was yeah, there were various yeah, points in that game where I was convinced that Casey DeSmith was not an NHL goalie. Yeah, like and yeah, like you said, Power's great. That was a great pass that he made. But at the same time, you know, it helps that your goal that the goalie you're you're facing didn't know where the, doesn't look like he knows where the puck is. You know, like it just, it was tough to watch. And like the guys had wide open looks at the net. It was hard. It'd be hard not to miss, especially at this level. So again, I don't know what, uh, what needs to be fixed with that. I do want to say one compliment, one compliment I do want to make, if we're going to try and find a positive with this team, Uh, Jason Zucker. I hope that he uh, continues to stay healthy because Man, he's having a great start to this season with uh, with the pl- with his play so far. You know, there's always been a question as to okay, how well are, do him and Gino play together? Because it seems like at times they don't really have the chemistry they should. But right now, I mean, they he's he's clicking with Gino, and those guys are playing well together. So uh, another question I want to post to you, I guess, um, are you a fan of? A Raquel playing with Sid and Gensel, or are you are you still pushing that agenda, or do you or do you like him with Gino and Zucker? Raquel has to go back up with Jake and Sid. I mm. think that they were playing their most. I think the team as a whole w- was playing their most effective hockey when Raquel was up there. You know, I understand what Mike Sullivan's thinking. I know that Gensel, Crosby, and Russ has been historically their best line, but. I feel like it's I feel like swapping those two wingers on those lines is good for the other two counterparts on each line respectively. I really like what Zucker and Malkin can do with Rust and I also adore what Gensel and Crosby can do with Ricard Raquel. Especially with Raquel's ability to go into dirty areas and win puck battles. It kind of reminds me of like a great value version of Chris Kunitz in a way. And another thing about Raquel too, that guy is just ripping the puck constantly now. Like it's, I, I think he, yeah, he obviously leads it. He leads the team in shots right now. I think he's averaging like over four a game. I'm pretty sure, or close to four a game, I should say. But he's, he has no hesitation. I think that's what they should be doing with Raquel. You have to utilize that guy and let him just, you know, rip the puck. You need a 30 goal season out of him, and that's what I think he can deliver. He's got five already through the first 11 games, so. Again, I think with him, I think he and Gino can figure it out. Like, like you said, 
when you, you you mentioned the word historic with Sid, Gensel, and Rust, if they're that good together, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice R- Ricard Raquel putting up 60 points instead of 70. You know, yeah. I feel like that's, yeah. that's a that's a trade off I'm willing to have. And again, I think the way and Gino's playing well right now too, so I don't think that it's like it's it's going to be like he'll he'll hold Raquel back a little bit. I think they just need some more time together. You got to remember, Raquel didn't play that long when he got with these guys whenever he right. got traded over from Anaheim because I, I forget how many games he had with Pitt last year, but he got hurt the first game of the, play, of the in round one against the Rangers last year. So, again, we never really got a chance to see how effective he could be with uh, Gino and, and Zucker. Now that we have those guys playing together, I feel like that's worth looking into, and hopefully they can become an elite second line because obviously that's what this team needs. And if my memory suits me correctly, they had the three of them together during game one before Ryan Lindgren hit him in the head. Hmm. Zucker, Malkin, and Raquel. You know, and yeah, you know, and another thing is, is like, it's never going to happen, but I would love to see them experiment with Raquel on the top power play unit. Just swap him out for Rust. Swap him out for Rust. Yeah, it's not. You know, yeah. it's it it won't. You know, which is okay. Well, but like, actually, well, hold on a sec. So, hmm. this is I what I'm. Th- I don't know if that would work as well though, because you think Rust is more of a you know, net front to bumper kind of guy. I don't think you'd right. use Raquel that way. You're, no, if you're going to use, I, if you're going to utilize Raquel, it's going to be on the half boards or maybe at the point. And the truth is, that wouldn't Raquel, be on, that wouldn't be on the first unit. Raquel would go to the point with Latang. Malkin would take the face off, and Sid would be the bumper, and Jake would be net front. Yeah. But I just, yeah, I don't know. Too- that's my that's my other thing is like the reason yeah. I love I love it whenever they line sit up in the bumper spot like they did it in two thousand eight whenever they went to the cup is like it's so it's so out of the ordinary. It's like putting a unicorn there. You know what I mean? Because like it's literally the best player alive playing for a lack of a better term the shittiest spot on the power play. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's what it is. So, if you are going to utilize Raquel at some point, you know, obviously you're going to have him on that second unit. I'm perfectly fine with him and POJ running the running stuff there. You know, I think, like I said, I think that's where his his skill set is be- is best utilized. You know, yeah. I don't see him as like putting them where they, where he, where they put Brian Ross. I don't think that would work as well. You know, you need him to uncork that one timer if you had like on a regular. So yeah, that's just yeah. my take on it. At least. You know, and I think that is what they will do. You know, big thing is they have to get Petrie off that second unit. Yeah, um, he's, he's not, so I mean, and we're talking, we're talking about historic things. I don't think we've covered this yet. Jeff Petrie is like, basically incapable of quarterbacking a power play. I mean, this is something that has been an issue all the way from back from his days in Edmonton. Like he is historically bad on the power play. At least from a metrics perspective, you know, I think the best thing that the Penguins could do with that second unit is Carter takes the face off the Zucker's the net front Heinen bumpers and then it's Raquel and POJ up top. Yeah, that would work out just fine. I completely forgot that Jeff Petrie played in Edmonton. It's been so long. I completely forgot that. <laughs> wow. People, people forget about, about that. that. Yeah, he was he was like the he tenth of David there. Oilers. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was. I guess he played in Montreal for like eight years. So I guess, yeah. you know, it's easy to forget that. But still, I when you said that, I was like, oh, my God, wait, he was an oiler? And I just yeah. looked it up. I'm like, yeah, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Getting, getting off topic. Um, yeah. Back to what you were, back to what you were saying. Uh, that should be your second unit right there. 
And I think, again, you utilize Raquel and POJ properly. You already have Heinen with Zucker. That unit will be just fine, depending on if you want to roll the dice with Carter there or maybe even, again, throw Sam Poole in there to see how he does at center. They'll be doing just fine. I think that, would, you know, you, you get that going and you're good to go. And another thing, too, I want to mention, because I think a lot of people are forgetting it, too, this team doesn't have has you know as in terms of their struggles at least they haven't had Teddy Bluger for a while now you know, he hasn't he's obviously yeah. missed time he's not gonna, he's he's also not playing tonight either so hopefully we see him back sometime next week they don't play again until Wednesday so hopefully after this at least so hopefully that will get him back in the lineup because like you said before obviously Ryan Paling is not your fourth line center he, he's a nice stopgap and like you said earlier good 13th guy to have but you know when you get Teddy Bluger back I think that's going to bring a lot more cohesiveness to the penalty kill which has been god awful up until this point yeah you know and it's unfortunate because I think we're getting to the point now like where I know I said before on the show like we got to get Jeff Carter to stop killing penalties but like we're to a point now where I think we have no choice but for Jeff Carter to kill penalties he's like your only option because I mean, you could you could keep Drew O'Connor in the lineup somehow and have him center a unit with Josh Archibald, but where are you going to put him? Like, who are you going to take out? Because, yeah, like that's the biggest thing is like, who are you going to take out? You know, the only player, in my opinion, that would be worth like health, healthy scratching Kasperi Kapanen over would probably be Sam Poulin. And he's getting that anyways right now. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's tough. Like, it's – and that's the biggest thing is, like, especially early on in Mike Sullivan's tenure, like, he had options. Like, if they were down one or two goals in a game, he'd be able to throw the entire freaking lineup in a blender and then somehow come through by the grace of God, you know, and come back and get in the game. But now he doesn't have that, you know, and like that's the biggest thing is like that's why it sucks them not having quality forward depth, because like. You know, last year you would have seen Heinen and Evan Rodriguez getting runs in the top six with guys whenever things went to hell in a handbasket, you know, you would have seen Jared McCann slot up into the top six, you know. There's no no one you can put up there now. No, there's literally, there's literally nobody that is remotely capable of doing it with the exception of Dan, Danton Heinen sometimes. Yeah, they did it whenever he was, they did it whenever Gensel was out for those few games. They had him with, uh, with Sid and it worked for a little bit too. So, but yeah, like you said, there's just, there isn't one guy that you can look at and say, all right, we're going to, if, you know, by some miracle, we need a little bit of a jolt offensively or we need a guy to fill in here. Outside of Dan Heinen, you don't really have that many choices. And, and honestly, after Heinen, this sucks saying it, your next best choice might actually be Josh Archibald. Which is devastating, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm kind of yeah. speechless right now over that, but that's, that's <laughs> like, it's just, it's, it's terrible, you know? And like, Sorry. part of me believes that when Bluger comes back and Carter comes back, they need to start scratching Kapanen for a couple of games and run Heinen, Bluger and Carter. I think that's the best chance you have at having a solid third line and just let Drew O'Connor center Brock McGinn and Josh Archibald. I don't think it would be that bad. I mean, we all know that it would be Ryan Paling there over Drew O'Connor, but like, I guess it is what it is. I don't know if I, I don't know how I feel about having Bluger as the, the third line center. I think that's, I think you're better utilizing him as that for, as that fourth line. Oh yeah, just, you know, just in my opinion, obviously. But like, it's just I think 
again, I'm totally on board with, with scratching Kasperi Kapanen because yeah, he just doesn't seem like he needs – he just – He's just out there taking space right now. He's yeah. not an effect. He's not being an effective player, and that's what this team needs. They need effectiveness, and they're not getting it from him. So yeah. you maybe a you couple of games a, you, in the press box and get his head right. You know. get a you get a sweater back whenever it looks like you actually want to put forth effort into being an NHL player. That's essentially where we are at. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, like they kind of applied that pressure to to POJ in this training camp. Yeah. And he's obviously risen to the occasion. I think it might be time to do the same thing with Kasperi Kapanen. Yeah. You know, it's just – it's crazy to me. You know, they're – every single player in their bottom six right now, and I don't count Bluger because he's hurt. Every single player in their bottom six right now, with the exception of Danton Heinen, should all either be playing on the fourth line or are replacement level NHL players. Yeah, that's not that's that's pretty accurate. And when you add in the amount of cap space that that a majority of them are taking up, it's even worse. Yeah, you got what caps getting what three mil now or two. Two or three. You have almost $10 million tied up between Carter, Kappen, and McGinn. Tough. Very tough. Very tough. Very tough. Then you tack in the tack on the $4.1 million you're um paying to Brian Dumoulin to drag him around like it's weekend at Bernie's. And it's even worse. Uh. <laughs> We're a lot. We're, we're lost now, man. We are. We're <laughs> tough. I don't think we've ever been this down bad before. It's been a while, if that's the case. <laughs> like, like this, I've, been I've, one of, this is one of the most cynical episodes we've ever done. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's bad. We are, we are so cynical. Oh man, this I might I be. Pre- I was this preaching might... the optimism thing. I don't think I have it. <laughs> I think I lost it all just now. Yeah. I no, think it's, it's gone. <laughs> it's done. It's over with. It's done with. Oh, you know, gosh. but real quick, do you want to just touch on a couple other teams? Like, yes, please. I've been watching please. a lot of I've been watching a lot of other teams as like an act of therapy. <laughs> and like, okay, I'm gonna throw three teams at you that I really enjoy watching. I love watching the Sabres, I love watching the Devils. And I love, love, love watching the Dallas Stars. So with Buffalo, man, that team, I don't want to say they kind of remind me of what the Penguins were in their early days with Sid and Gino, because I don't think they have that talent level just yet. But you look at the majority of their core, I think – if you look at their core, quote unquote, Alex Tuck's the oldest player, and he's only like 26, I think. Right. And they're already that good. Right. I mean, Owen Powers, 19, Rasmus Dollings, 23, 24. And yeah. I think, yeah, he's, I think he's, that's his age. He was the, I think he got drafted the year I graduated high school. So I think that would be yeah. the same age. But yeah, um, yeah, you have those guys. Uh, what's his name? Tage Thompson had that great game against uh, Detroit, went out and scored mm-hmm. six points. Not a big deal. Then you have uh, Dylan Cousins, who's also a solid option for that team. Yeah. I mean, I mean they, this might be the year that they actually break through. And I think it's, it's about damn time for them. The biggest thing for them is Jeff Carter and Kyle Lock Pozo do not look incompetent either. Jeff Carter? Or did I say uh, Jeff Skinner? Jeff Skinner. There you go. Sorry. I've <laughs> I've been too much. I've been too deep on the Jeff <laughs> Carter. Uh, I've been too busy, like, on the Jeff Carter damnation train to, you know. Yeah. But yeah. Skinner and Ipozo I I look decent, it. you know. Victor Olofsson is a quality, like, second-tier piece he, for them. He's you been know, good, too. Yeah. 
And the biggest thing is, is like Kevin Adams drafts well. They're still going to draft a good player this year, no matter where they pick. And Mm -hmm. they still have Matthew Savoy waiting in the wings to join this group at some point in the next two to three years. I'd say the only concern, and I don't even know if it's really a concern with this team right now, is uh, is their goaltending. Obviously, they've. Kind of, I think they're kind of like indecisive as to which one they're going to go with. I think they're leaning more towards Comrie, just because he is a you know a little bit younger, and he is, you know, I think he he sat long enough in Winnipeg to the point where now it's like okay, I'm ready to to take the reins somewhere. And not to mention, I just don't feel like they want to put their faith in 41 year old Craig Anderson at this point either. But I'd say that's that might be your only concern as far as the team is concerned right now is just, you know, which goalie are you going to really put your faith into? And, I mean, again, Comrie is not a bad option. It's just it comes down to inexperience with him. It doesn't matter in the long term, though. They're basically riding the two of these guys out for the next year or so because they have Uko Pekka Lukanen in – the in the AHL right now and then they have Devin Levi at the collegiate level and both of them look like they can I don't know which one but one of them's going to end up being the next like franchise caliber goalie for the Sabres and if Buffalo does know one thing they can get the franchise goalie figured out because yes. they've had them for for plenty of their yes. times exactly for five or ten years they've had them Exactly. So, you yeah. know, they'll be good. Moving on to New Jersey, though, that defense is incredible. Like, I would put it up against Colorado at times. They're that good because let me pull it up here. Marie knows their highest scoring defenseman, by the way. Oh, wait, never mind. Dougie Hamilton is. Dougie Hamilton I was, is. I was about but to say, Mar- don't you Mar- don't you do me like that? Marino's second. Marino is yeah. second. So we got Jonas Siegenthaler and Dougie Hamilton, Ryan Graves and John Marino. And I don't really count Brendan Smith. So we're gonna go B- Kevin Ball and Damon Severson. You you literally have one of the most underrated defensemen in hockey, big chilling on the right side of your third D pair. Must be nice. The only thing that's going to kill them, like we said with Buffalo, is goaltending. I don't trust either of the two. Talking about Mackenzie Blackwood and Vitek Vanacek. Yes. Um, I, I'll say this. I don't have 110% faith in, in – I wouldn't have a lot of faith in Vanacek. Blackwood, I don't know why I, I, I kind of hold him – high up there for some reason i maybe i'm just delusional but i think that uh i think if they went with him i think that would be the guy you'd want to you know really put your faith into i think he just needs a little more time to get things right again he's 26 now and van checks 27 so that's just that's where I see it at least, I think he might be your go-to guy. I don't know if Vanacek's really a starter per se, but it just we'll see how things work out there. Yeah, and I, th- I feel like Mackenzie Blackwood reminds me a lot of Tristan Jari in terms of, like, their come up, you know? Like, because there was a time where we didn't think Jari was going to be much of anything other than a backup goaltender in the NHL, and then mm-hmm. he had that banger of the year where he made the all-star game and then he basically took Matt Murray's job. Yeah, pretty much. So, you know, yep. I don't know. The I just were hyping up. What? So what about the other time team you were hyping up there? Dallas. Dallas's top six forward group is just really good. Mm-hmm. You know, Mason Marchment was a great signing for them. And, you know, this is what I keep saying about, like, how nice it has to be to have young talent. You have Jamie Ben playing on a, on a, your third line with a 19-year-old Wyatt Johnston and tied to Landria, who's 22. And they're putting up points, you know. And 
in a lot of ways, this is just allowing them to have a shutdown fourth line with the combination of Radic Fax and Luke Glenn You know, I mean, I think that they are built to win for the next several years because obviously you have Miro Heiskanen. And the biggest thing is, is like, they got Niels Lundqvist, which I know everybody thought it was insane to trade a first round pick for Niels Lundqvist, but like, he's really, really good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, like you said, I don't know about the, I'm looking at their numbers. I don't know about the third line putting up points take. Cause I think Jamie Ben just got it. Jamie Ben just got his first goal here last night or a few nights ago, or a couple nights ago against Arizona. And it was a gimme at that. I think, uh, what's his name for the coyotes literally just the goalie literally just put it right on his on his stick it was one of the worst giveaways i've ever seen in my life yeah it was almost like tristan jari in game five kind of giveaway where he just (laughs) put it right put it right on his stick i don't know if you've seen the highlight of it or not but it's just it was an absolute pizza right to him he he could crazy he could have blown on the puck it would have went in but yeah just uh again when you have that young talent like they do, you know, Robertson's obviously leading the way. He's only 23 years old. Marchman's 27. Wyatt Johnson's 19. Delandria's 22. Lundqvist is 22 years old. So I feel like that's, they're, again, set up to win for a long time. And the veterans are still doing their thing too. Sagan's putting up nine points in 11 games. He's doing all right. Joe Pavelski is 38 years old and is almost a point per game still. I don't know why... I don't know why I'm mesmerized about that. I think, you know, Joe Pavelski plays a, a pretty simple game anyway. He's obviously always been like the net front guy, but I think he's got a lot more skill than most of those guys do. So he, so it helps him, you know, put up his numbers and everything, but he's been, he, he's on their first, I correct me if I'm wrong. Is he on their first line? Yeah. Yeah. Like he's still that good. That's the thing yeah. that I feel like people don't talk about enough is like, for the past several years, he's been in Dallas. Joe Pavelski has been quietly just kicking ass there. Yeah, it's. I mean, he was he was a, he was a damn near point per game player last year. He had eighty one points in eighty two games. Eighty two, and he had fifty one and fifty six the year before. Yeah, like, and I think a lot of that is thanks to how good Jason Robertson is. But like, still, man, like that is that, that definitely helps that's unreal and you know the other big thing is like dallas the way they run their power play is so interesting because you know they have all that talent but of all people for them to run it through it runs through rope hints Mm -hmm. you know so like it's it's a it's a real interesting you know and the biggest thing for them is like tyler sagan is looking like himself again yeah, and that was the you know. big key for them. I know that was where a lot of people were skeptical about how's Dallas going to be this year because obviously you have Sagan who's, you know, making so much money, but it's like, is he going to be able to, you know, put up the numbers needed in order for this team to succeed? He looks like he's back to his old form, and that was a huge key for them. So I'm glad that he's sort of got his head on his shoulders right again. So that's good to see. Another guy that I want to mention that's sort of having a, not even sort of having a resurgence, he is having a resurgence. What the hell's gone into Eric Carlson? I know. I I was waiting for you to bring it up. I was going to segue it real nice, but man, he has been, I feel like we got like 2014 Eric Carlson back. I it's don't. It's ridiculous. Like I remember, like I, I got him in fantasy, and I think I got the steal of the draft. It's ridiculous how how great he's been. You know, he was again. You know, we I don't know if it was just I don't think I want I don't want to blame Brent Burns saying that he was you know maybe taking away the offense from Carlson or anything like that. I won't I won't say that, but it's just like now that Carlson is the guy on the back end for them, I think he's a lot more comfortable with that. I think now he's looking at it saying, okay, I'm running, you know, this is my show again. I have the freedom to, you know, do what I want. And another thing that probably helps too is he's, I think he's actually healthy for once too. Yeah. That's a big thing. He's always been, you know, 
hit or miss with the injuries. So I think now that he's back to 100, 100%, he's, he's just lighting the world on fire. And I, I think it's awesome to see how much of the resurgence he's had. You, you know, I was watching some old highlights of him back in 2017 when he was the best defenseman in the league and there was no question. It was unquestionable how good he was to see him sort of return to that form again is great. It just sucks that he's doing it on San, in San Jose <laughs> because the team, I don't, it's just, it's not going to be well there. Well, that's, that's the thing that sucks about it is like, no matter how well he plays, they will still be at the bottom of the standings. No yeah, matter what, the only do. team below them in their division is Anaheim. You know, and my thing is this: is like, could it potentially get him out of San Jose? Like, could he potentially play himself onto a contender? With that contract, I don't know. Well, that's the issue: is like they'd have to eat <laughs> half of the contract, yeah. and you know, if you're going into a rebuild, you don't want to have to have 5.75 million dollars worth of dead cap on your rock on your books for the next four years i can't really i can't really say that you don't want to because i mean the the minnesota wild have 14 to 15 million dollars in dead cap on their books for the next two until the end of the 2024 2025 season so I don't and know. They're trying to, and they're trying to win a cup right now. That's a terrible situation to, be able to have a part to be a part in right now. I feel bad for Billy Garen because you you have a talent group with Dollar Bill Carrill and uh, what and uh, Zuccarello and other guys too. That you know you should be contending, but you're gonna have these this dead cap on your team because the the guy before you paid an ungodly amount of money to two guys that was not going to be worth it. It's, it's funny though, because like they're going to, they're going to lose Matt Dumba because of this. Like they won't be able to pay Matt Dumba. I don't know, man. That's just, it's so crazy. Now, speaking of fantasy hockey steals, Gabe Velarde in Los Angeles, that guy has been, sick to start the year um let me pull them up real quick he has 13 points in 13 games he has eight goals and five assists and he's currently playing with kopitar and velarde like this guy has been so good that it has forced kevin fiala down to the third line and he was like their big prize this offseason kevin yeah. fiala yeah so yeah, which, I'd say that that has been a, a big surprise for them too. Which I mean, it's not all, it's not all that bad for Fiala. He's still gonna end up playing with Quentin Byfield and Arthur Kaliev, but still, he'll, he'll he'll get his numbers regardless. It's, he's second on the team right now. He's point he's point per game right now too. They might they might honest to God like Phil Kessel and the Penguins themselves here, a little bit. Like, because they have such quality forward depth. And as much as you hate Brendan Lemieux, him and Lazat playing with Carl Grundstrom on the fourth line is actually a pretty solid fourth line, no matter what way you that, spend. That would work well for them. Yeah. 100%. It's interesting. Plus, Drew Doughty actually looks good this year. Like, that's crazy. Like, I feel like everybody's turning back the clock. Why can't Jeff Petrie turn back the clock? Because the Penguins sold their soul for a back-to-back, and now we're stuck with our current reality. It also kills me. They could have had Brent Burns, too. Really? You think so? I think they could have had Brent Burns because they ate that contract down for Carolina where he's only making 528 It could have worked potentially. I don't know though. It's just it, it is what it is. I mean, I'm trying to see. I'm trying to like visualize that. Like, I don't know. Like, if you if you were gonna, I think the only way you would have brought in a Brent Burns is if you knew Latang wasn't coming back. Yeah, and it's it's hard. It's almost like everybody saying they wanted to sign Phil again in the off season. It's like 
you would have to do so much messing around with your power play to accommodate said player that it's not even worth it. Exactly. You know, um, and real quick, uh, going back to LA, you know, if that team could be decent, it seems like a, a trend I'm noticing here is just their goaltending again is questionable because quick, quick, obviously isn't the guy anymore. And Cal Peterson is, uh, I won't say he's bad, but he's definitely not uh, where he should be. Yeah. I don't know. Let me, let me look at this real quick. Oh yeah. They've, they've both been pretty bad this year. Holy yeah. crap. Um, I don't know. It's tough. Like, I feel like they may have given Cal Peterson too much money too quick. I feel like that sign, that extension may have been a little premature. Um, yeah, but in defense, they probably didn't plan on, you know, going out and getting another goalie. They were probably just looking at it saying, all right, Jonathan Quick, you can – we're going to slide you to a backup role now. We're going to roll the dice with this kid and not yeah. a kid anymore. He's 28. He's in the prime of his career. So Yeah, I think, you know – I mean, I think that they'll be okay. You know, and my – the whole thing is this. is like Jonathan Quick, it's like the same situation as Matt Murray. Like – as long as you magically get yourself to the playoffs, they just randomly flip the switch. Yeah, but he hasn't flipped it for a while. I know, but they haven't been in the playoffs for a while. It also drives me nuts because, like, the Kings over the course of time have had both Darcy Kemper and Ben Bishop, and they just let him walk. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, Darcy Kemper and Ben Bishop weren't like Darcy Kemper and Ben Bishop, you know, back then. At that point, yeah, exactly. At that point, yeah, yeah. Same thing with Martin yeah. Jones. Exactly. Martin Jones was yeah. Martin Jones was was uh, Jonathan Quick's backup in twenty fourteen. Literally, the amount of people that John like the amount of quality backups Jonathan Quick has had in his career it's it's disgusting. Yeah. He's had he had Bernier, he had Bernier in 2012, Martin Jones, Ben Bishop, Camper, like you said. That's probably something we're forgetting, honestly. Probably. And then Cal Peters. Yeah. I mean, it's just I'm looking here trying to find. I mean, Peterson's been his guy for a while now. Yeah, Jack Campbell. Oh, that's right, dude. Holy hell. Yeah, Jack Campbell in 2020 before he got traded to the, to the Leafs. This is it's like it's like the Sean McVay coaching carousel, but with goaltenders. That's insane. Yeah. How nuts is that? <laughs> that's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't. I can't even believe that. That's nuts. <laughs> All right. Anything else you want to touch on? Because I feel like we've completely we've taken the circle. wheels off the bus here. Yeah, we've gone, we've gone full circle. Yeah. All righty, guys. This has been another episode of Four Checking TV. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Four Checking TV and subscribe to us on YouTube. Thank you, guys, and good night. <laughs>